Welcome to Decoding Superhuman. This show is a deep dive into obsessions with performance and how to improve the human experience. Twice a week, I explore the latest science, technology, and tactics with experts in various fields of human optimization. I'm your host, Boomer Anderson. Enjoy the journey. Superhumans. One of the most requested topics for this show is peptides. When combing the universe of experts and people who have both theory but also practice with peptides, one name continues to come up, and that is Jean Francois Tremblay. He is a biochemist, he studied pharmacology, and he has worked in exercise physiology. Jean-Francois has dealt with peptides or SARMs both in theory and in practice since the early 1990s. So I was absolutely thrilled when he accepted the invite to come on the show. In fact, when we were emailing, I said, please allot 90 minutes to talk about this topic. And he told me 90 minutes would really just scratch the surface and leave it to the expert to be absolutely correct. Today, we just scratched the surface on peptides, going into things like, what are the differences between SARMs and peptides, BPC-157? We get into TESA and Ipamorlin. We talk about CJC and so many others. But again, we are just scratching the surface. I'm extremely grateful for Jean-Francois' time, so let's pass it over to that conversation. The show notes for this one, you're going to want to check those out, are at decodingsuperhuman.com slash peptides. Jean-Francois, thank you so much for taking the time. Hey, no, thanks to you. So today, and one of my favorite things about hosting the podcast is when I want to go deep on a topic and learn as much as possible as a person, uh, one of the things I get to do is reach out to experts in these fields. And so today we're going to be talking about peptides, which... I've done a little guinea pigging on this, but I'm looking forward to this conversation very much. Okay, great. So let's get started. Uh, So what I want to do before we go into the weeds, so to speak, is just lay the foundations for people because there may be some people who are relatively new to this field uh, listening to this, but how would you explain a peptide to anyone who's listening right now? Okay, um, well, basically, peptide is a, f- a smaller protein, mm-hmm. basically. It's a chain of uh, amino acid, and what makes it different from pro- protein is that uh, it's the number of amino acids. Usually, it's maybe up to 50, 60 amino acids. Uh, can be, uh, listen, growth hormone could be classified as a peptide because it's a chain of 191 uh, amino acids, but that's kind of borderline. It's almost a protein uh, because it's fold on itself, so it's not a linear chain, but basically it's a chain of amino acids only. Mm-hmm. And if you hook up many different peptides, that becomes a protein. So that's the breakdown. Protein, peptides, and if you break it down more, you get uh, amino acids. Okay, so the folding, is that the differentiating factor or is it just... Well, that's important, uh, actually, for some peptides protein, like uh, growth hormone, because it's a long... It's not only a linear uh, chain of 191 amino acids, Mm -hmm. but then... The, the chain folds on itself a few times. If I'm not mistaken, it's three times. Mm-hmm. So that gives kind of a 3D dimension to the molecule. And uh, it, it needs to be there for its activity, for the receptors to recognize it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. 
Amazing. So one of the other areas, and I just want to differentiate between the two topics before we go deep here, uh, that comes up when we're discussing things like uh, performance enhancement is SARMs. Oh, uh, yes. Do you mind just differentiating between peptides and SARMs? Okay. Well, peptides are naturally 99 point something percent. We produce them in the body already. So all those peptides you see uh, advertised or in what we'll talk about, we produce them naturally in the body or fractions of naturally uh, occurring peptides. As uh, SARMs, they're uh, totally synthetic, basically. Mm -hmm. They're very uh, unrelated to uh, steroids in terms of structures. In terms of effect, they have a lot of similarity. But actually, if uh, that's... uh, you know, I've been wondering for a long time because you look at a molecule of a SARM and it looks like nothing we know. Uh, it doesn't look like testosterone or derivate at all, but then it turns out that, and that's old, back in the 90s, uh, the, well, the drug itself is older. The, there was uh, anti-androgens that are synthetic molecules and they, it would be used to block the receptors to testosterone. You know, if mm-hmm. for some disease, you need to block that activity. So some guy in his lab, one day thought, he says, hey, what if, uh, because those molecules have a higher affinity for the receptors than uh, testosterone. So one guy thought, he say, hey, since they have such a high affinity, what if we could modify it? Uh, so instead of, because what it was doing, it, it would bind to the receptor, but wouldn't start the cascade of events. Mm-hmm. It would just block the receptor. So he thought, hey, what if it would bind and start the anabolic cascade? And they started to tweak with that drug, that molecule, and songs were born. So that's how they came. They, they they were born actually from anti-androgen to uh, being modified to become not androgenic, but more uh, anabolic. So very few people know that. And it's fascinating to see that we can develop something so powerful by almost looking at the exact opposite effect. Mm-hmm. Um, again, before just setting foundations for people, Peptides can have a variety of effects, right? Mm -hmm. And these can be so wide ranging. Do you mind just touching a little bit in terms of what are the various effects that peptides can, can provide for people? Well, they have pretty much any effect you want. Uh, (laughs) No, we, uh, there has been more than 7,000 peptides uh, identified already in the body. Uh, we don't know all what they do, but if you look at research, now what happened is almost every week there is a new article coming out. And it's not an article pointing out a new peptide they found. They knew it existed, but just some team, they say, okay, let's look now at this one. What does it do? So they they identify the function of those peptides. So and they have a lot, like over seven thousand to look at. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but it's going very very fast, and they're they're everywhere in the body, and at uh, it can go from uh, repairing to modulating uh, hormones to uh, aesthetic skin. Uh, they're pretty much somewhere every step of the uh, metabolic pathways. Mm-hmm. It's pretty, that's why it's growing so big. Uh, now pharmaceutical company jumped in the, 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 the train because they saw the potential. They saw the, the booming of it. So of course they want their bigger piece of pie. Of course. <laughs> of pie. And. In the more in the broader uptake, I see it as the next uh, the new frontier in medicine. Mm-hmm. 
if it goes as it should go, probably within 10 years, uh, you, you will see a doctor and uh, it would be rare that you don't come out with the prescription for some peptides. So one of my understandings of peptides is because they're not patentable, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. a lot of these pharmaceutical companies are not really investing the dollars. Oh, in it. they are now. They, they are found, now. Okay. So what's changed? They found their way. If you look at the newer patents, you will read uh, peptides, state, uh, okay, method of synthesis. They, they patent the method of synthesis, okay. but that's easy to tweak so you don't break the patent. But okay, method of synthesis and its applications. So they don't patent the peptide, they patent the application of. So, and then they would list all the disease or conditions that this peptide can uh, work on. So, uh, for example, time is an alpha one, mm -hmm. uh, immune system uh, peptide, then it will, they know for sure hepatitis B, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, cancer, da da da. They will list everything. So now, and then they sell it in pharmacies. So if another company wants to sell peptides in pharmacy, they have to find another application because the doctor or the pharmacist will have the obligation, if it's for hepatitis C, he will have the obligation to give the patient that one from that company that has the patent for that application. So now they got that, so they're started to enter the market. Yeah, pardon my my French here, but that seems like a crock of shit way to file a patent. You're just saying like, "Hey, this could work to this effect." Well, are, are you surprised? Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be, right? <laughs> but it just um, it, it's unfortunate because you have this very, as you say, natural compounds in these bodies that could uh -oh. lead to amazing uh, effects and we're going to now corner the market with some sort of drug company and and the of course there is a very strong relationship between the FDA in the US and pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. so now FDA is slowly starting to probably will be able to uh stop compounding pharmacies to compound peptides because in the states that's possible. Mm -hmm. So they are starting to kind of crack down on that, and probably next step will be to crack down on uh, internet sales of peptides as research chemicals. So this is interesting because this happened with SARMs, right? Um, to a certain uh, yeah, it's it's kind of happening. Yeah, and now so I, I've heard about this factor with the FDA basically making banning peptide formulations and compound pharmacies. And you say, how, how far do you think we are from that? Well, keep in mind, after all, they're government people, you know, so yep. they're, they're not that fast. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, basically, they're paid by the hour. So, uh, but yet, uh, not so far. With peptides, it's hard to tell. It depends. Uh, once they get the pressure for pharmaceutical companies, it can go fast because mm -hmm. now you know there is a lot of lobbying money behind. So that's a big incentive. It's hard to tell. And that's for the U.S. Uh, it doesn't mean it will happen worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, in Canada... Uh, we have a tendency to follow what's happening in the U.S. in terms of uh, pharmaceutical laws. Not all the time, but most. But we're like, just to give you an idea, usually we're two, three years behind. So okay. if it happens in the U.S., maybe two, three years after. And worldwide, depending on the countries, it may happen in some, may not happen in others. That's yet to see. Gotcha. But uh, eventually... Uh, it's hard to give a time frame. Uh, medium term, it will happen. Interesting. Jean-Francois, how did you get into this field? Because, uh, you know, a few years ago, it was very, 
you know, it was kind of heard of on the Reddit threads on the internet. It yeah. wasn't, it wasn't really a, a mainstream well, topic. Well, there, there, there was a huge uh, underground uh, culture. And, okay, I mentioned that in other podcasts too, but if you look back, the actual first biohackers that that name didn't exist back then yeah. were uh, bodybuilders. Mm-hmm. Even from the 60s, 70s, you know, they're the first who started to use steroids. But it went further than, than that. They were always looking at what could they use, supplement, drug-wise, whatever, not only to improve, uh, to improve every aspect of their endeavor, you know, get bigger, blah, blah, blah. So it went further than just steroids. They would look into, okay, what uh, can I use to improve my focus during training? Mm -hmm. And bang, they were into nootropics. Or uh, because if they were using a lot of anabolic steroids, uh, they had a hard time to sleep or develop anxiety. So bang, they're into sleeping stuff. And, uh, you know, they were... Not only steroids, people, they think, oh, yeah, steroids. No, they, they, they tweak with, and I'm from, I, I was not a bodybuilder, but back in the 80s and 90s, I was in that world. And mm-hmm. basically, they, they were way in advance. And peptides, you know, mostly the repairing peptides, if they would get an injury, uh, the, that famous... Uh, Tanning peptide, uh, of which I heard back in the 90s, you know, reading in a French magazine. Uh, that's, that was my first introduction to, uh, to peptides. Uh, so basically that, that comes a long way back, but because that's a subculture, mm-hmm. it would stay within that subculture and not go out so much. So it was kind of the little secret of, uh, in the sport world, you know, and, you know, you, you would see an athlete, a professional athlete, you heard that he got injured for whatever, and you say, oh, that, that's it, it's finished, and bang, three weeks after he's back playing, you say, oh, what happened, you know? Yeah. Uh, steroids don't do that, you know, other things do. So, it has been there for a long time, but within, uh, as you said, it would pop out on Reddit, on, on those forums. Uh, it has been there a long time. Yeah. But it, now it's, it's getting mainstream almost, mm-hmm. basically. So, and, and this fascinates me because I, I was a, a loose participant in the bodybuilding world in the early 2000s. Mm. And it, it, when you started getting really into that, I, I first, I think that people need to realize that the concept of performance enhancing drugs is no longer uh, necessarily a bad thing. It's not some guy mm. mixing testosterone in his bath in China. Um, yeah. There's better ways that we're doing that. But uh, what we're talking about here, some of these early adopters were kind of the controversies in Major League Baseball, right? Uh, For example, yeah. yeah. No, they would take, uh, what's his name? Baseball coach. Oh, the baseball coach. Yeah, and he started, and 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 uh, those people, they're they're crazy in a good, kind of in a good way. Is the one who discovered kind of that, or some doctor working with him, you know, intranasal insulin. Mm-hmm. You know, who would have thought of that? You know, okay, let's try it up the nose. You know, <laughs> and bang, they got an amazing effect. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you because bodybuilders, they don't mind or uh, high level professional athletes they don't mind going to uh, the extremes and if it may work they're gonna try it Mm -hmm. and if they have no clue well there's only one way to find out and bang they'll try it and i've done it too with a few things it served me well so good so far Mm -hmm. but you know that's and that's how it advanced actually you know science it's rare that they actually discover something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say that 90% of the time, uh, scientific research is, is more uh, historical research. <laughs> you know, they take something that, oh, you know, people are, you know, it's being used at the time. Let's look 
at why it works and then they go into that research. But uh, a lot of time, it's, it's done already. And a good friend of mine, uh, Charles Polican, used to say, you know, uh, 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 practitioners are always ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he would mention a, a study that came out in 2005 about one train, training method, and it was a title was, uh, I don't remember the technique, but anyway, uh, I could send you the study if you want. Please to do. It later. Uh, in 2005, it's a, a new approach to uh, strength training or something. Mm -hmm. And when he saw that, he said, well, I've been doing that for 30 years. You know? <laughs> and then he talked to his coach, the one uh, who taught him that method. And they went back like in, 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 in the 40s, you know, when it was used. Mm -hmm. So he said, and now this guy decided to do a study about it, found it worked and published Charles was a practitioner, so he said, look, if I had waited for that study to come out, a lot of Olympics would have passed by. Mm -hmm. So it's the same in that field, you know, and that's why now the biohacking world, that's amazing. You know, it's N equal one most of the time, but uh, it's better than N equals zero, and at least you have good clues on things. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they, they make, uh, that's why part of what I do because I do have a company that make peptides, but I, I try to uh, uh, to get a close relationship with my clients. I give consultations online and all that, and uh, because I learn a lot from the feedbacks of people using them, and mm -hmm. luckily now it's like hundreds and hundreds I get feedback from. Uh, oh, okay, you know what? So I'm I tweak with that and see, okay, that didn't work, that worked, blah, blah, blah. You, it's, it's fascinating what's happening. I, and I, listen, and I'm not publishing anything. So if you're waiting for publication of what is being done right now, well, it's not going to happen on my side. Okay. So don't, you know, that, that's one thing. The trend we have today of uh, research-based, it's a good thing. Mm-hmm up to a point, but we went to the other extreme, you know, of the pendulum. Uh, and that makes a lot of people discard the, uh, yeah, it's clinician. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, when you go see a doctor, a good one, what's the first thing he's going to do? He's going to ask you questions. He's not going to, and if it's good, Within 10, 15 minutes, he has a pretty good idea of what's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. But because we're so science-based now, then he has the obligation to send you to do a bunch of tests, which is very costly, to support what he knew already. Most of the time, there is a reason because sometimes they make mistake. If he will have done the test, then, you know, but to give you an idea that there is a balance of things. So now they're at the extreme that it has to be backed up by a bunch of tests. Uh, eventually I hope it will reach a medium point where, uh, uh, you know, when I talk about uh, clinical, it's experience from people working with that. You know, you take some people who have worked uh, in the field for 10, 20, 30 years, and they're pretty good that they know what's happening, even if it's not published. Mm -hmm. So, if again, if you wait for publication, you may wait a long, long time. So, there's so many questions I can go on the back yeah. of this, because I would love your opinions on things like myostatin mm. knockouts and all that stuff. Yeah. But uh, when we're looking at the bodybuilding world, specifically is the bodybuilding world is being early adopters to some of these compounds. Oh, yeah. uh, many people are going to say the longevity of the bodybuilding world and some of the downsides that happen to these guys later on in life. Uh, okay. Would love to hear your opinion on yeah. this. You know, they're too big. Uh, that's, you know, we talked now that obesity is, is, is bad. Mm -hmm. It is. 
and it shortens your life. But me, I believe it's not obesity per se, it's the overweight. And that's kind of what you see with bodybuilders. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, there is an age for everything. So if you weigh 260 pounds when you're 30, your body can take it. If you are a bodybuilder and don't want to give that up and do everything you can to still weigh 240, 250, when you're 55, when you're 60, uh, no, you know, your organs, your heart, everything, no, that's too much. Mm-hmm. And, and that's being overweight too. So look at... Uh, in Japan, where they have the highest longevity. Uh, but you look at uh, sumo wrestlers, and they, you know, they're big, fat, but they're very muscular too, mm-hmm. and they're healthy. You know, they're, they eat fish, rice, you know, a lot of it, but basically it's a very healthy diet. Their yeah. life expectancy is 60 to 65 years old, mm-hmm. and that's all related I believe, to their uh, overweight. And you see that in the bodybuilding world. You have Mm -hmm. those guys, they don't want to give up uh, for whatever reason. And those are the ones who who don't live so long. You look at other ones, look at Arnold Schwarzenegger, at the part where he became vegetarian, but just right before. (laughs) Uh, You know, uh, the guy is is healthy, but you know, he doesn't wait... uh, uh, 200 and something pounds, you know, they realize, uh, you know, I, uh, Ben Pakulski is a good friend of mine mm-hmm. and is a lot into uh, uh, longevity now. And his problem, he's trying to, to lose weight, but mm-hmm. he, he has a hard time. You know, his muscular mass is there, but he wants to lose some of it. He realized that, no, you cannot carry that much weight. Mm-hmm. And it comes down to that, carrying too much weight. doesn't matter if it's uh, muscle or fat. Too much weight is too much weight. Well said. Well said. So let's transition now back into peptides. And <laughs> before, because I have to throw this disclaimer out there, you know, anything that we say here is not medical advice. You know, people. No, 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 no. Even, information. Yeah. Okay. We're just sharing information. Uh, please do do your own research. But it, just general things with peptides. I would love to just hear your thoughts about a lot of these are injectables, right? And Many people are listening. Most of them. Yeah. Uh, almost all of them, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. And most of those are subcutaneous, right? Is there any dangers in injecting, injecting yourself? Any injection, even given by the best of doctors, there is always, always, always a little, little, little risk of infection mm-hmm. if you don't do it right. Otherwise, No. Because it's sub Q, you know, uh, you know that air bubble and the syringe. That's when you do intravenous. You know, otherwise you don't have to worry about that. So no, there isn't uh, risks uh, of doing it. Uh, diabetic people they do it for decades, mm-hmm. two, three, four times a day. Nothing happened. You know, it's 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 uh, amazingly safe. And most people, you know, they say, oh, injections, until they do the first one and they say, oh, that's it, you know, and that, it's really nothing, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fear is much bigger than uh, the actual uh, act. Okay. So uh, is there a broad, not prescription here, but uh, just recommendation around cycling? Are all peptides needed to be cycled or are certain ones, can you run them forever, forever? Well, okay, okay. <laughs> the, the concept of cycling actually come from, comes from the bodybuilding world. Mm-hmm. They, they would cycle anabolics because it would take a lot of it. And, you know, to give a break because they can be harsh on organs, on your skin, on your own production. So, you know, they they would cycle to kind of uh, decrease long-term the side effects of high dosages. So the concept transpired to the biohacking world. Uh, For for example, you know, you'll hear many times, oh, when you... um, 
mix your peptides, you know, and because they come in powder and you have to add water. No, you have to be careful. Yeah. Don't shake it. Well, that comes from bodybuilders using growth hormones back in the 90s. And as I told you, growth hormone is folded three times and that fold is all held by uh, weak bonds. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you shake it too much, you're going to break those bonds, those bonds, break the 3D uh, aspect of the molecule and then it's not going to work. So it, it transpired to other peptides. Oh, but no, no, the, they're much more stable than growth hormone. Mm -hmm. But they assume that if that was true for growth hormone, it's true for all other peptides. Mm -hmm. When it's not, most of them, you know, you could shake it. Uh, listen, we make peptides. Uh, the last, last step of just before lyophilization, we put them in, um, what do you call it, uh, well, you have seen when you go buy paint and you can ask them to shake your gallon yeah, of paint. Yeah, exactly. Well, there, there is little apparatus like that. To be sure, it's all dissolved. So we put, but it's a micro ultrasound mm -hmm. vibrations. And they, uh, all, all, all the peptides in liquid go through that to ensure 100% uh, dissolution. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they were to be break down, broke down, they would be broken down right there mm -hmm. because it shakes like a lot. And no, and then we retest after, you know, and purity remains. It doesn't affect. They're, they're very, very stable, basically. So, uh, so me dropping of, that bottle of BPC one five seven is probably not a big issue. Not at all. Okay. And, and, and other people, they think that that's funny. They say, yeah, but you know, if I keep it too long at room temperature, will it turn bad? Well, no, you know, it's not milk. It doesn't turn bad. Mm -hmm. Like one day it's all good. And the next day it's no good. Uh, over time, you may have little degradation when it's in liquid. Some, faster a few you have to be very careful it's very fast but most of them it's very long and that degradation let's say bpc 157 could be you have a nine ninety nine point three percent peptide and maybe after two weeks it's going to be down to 99.2 or 99.1 mm -hmm. you know a little will be gone but the bulk will be there it's going to be as effective so you understand it's uh, a lot of misconception of about degradation and uh, effectiveness and um, yeah, and most of it comes from growth hormone. Interesting. Uh, let's dive into some of these peptides if you don't sure. mind, because you know since I have you, I have to ask a whole bunch of questions. Some uh, we'll start with the healing peptides and just kind of the one that we just mentioned. So BPC-157 is something that I've guinea pigged on myself a little bit, and I've certainly used it or recommended it to people with, with gut healing issues. What are some of the things that we can use BPC-157 for and can't? <laughs> Because it seems okay. like it seems like a miracle uh, miracle pill sometimes. Uh, yeah, when I talk about that peptide, I feel like you know those uh, snake oil uh, sellers, you know, a hundred years ago. You know, it cures everything and all that. Mm -hmm. But this one actually does. It's listen. It's so broad. And uh, it's not all published, but in clinical experience, mine and from other uh, clinicians, it's almost a moron proof uh, peptide. You know, somebody, whatever you have, you're not sure, just take BPC and chances are it's going to fix it. <laughs> uh, it. It heals everything. Mm-hmm. So far, you know, I've seen people with uh, prostate problems, with uh, liver problems, with uh, kidney problems, lung problems, brain problems. Uh, and that's beside what it's mostly known for, you know, from uh, 
skeletal muscular injuries, mm -hmm. it fixes pretty much everything. Uh, it repairs everywhere. So and amazingly good to fix the gut. You know, uh, intestinal permeability, it's, it works amazingly there. Mm -hmm. So, again, the only thing that you have to, uh, as a clinician, when you use peptides, and more so if you work with people who have some kind of uh, disease or condition, is that if part of that condition is some form of uh, autoimmune mm -hmm. uh, condition, some people actually uh, develop, uh, have an autoimmune response to the peptides. Interesting. They, they recognize it as a foreign agent. And so if you suspect if the clinician suspects that some autoimmune condition, he should start with uh, uh, very small dosages and have some uh, Benadryl, not too far in case. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, on the bulk, it's rare. Uh, actually, I got aware of that not so long ago when I started to work with people who had uh, chronic fatigue, Lyme disease, and uh, uh, autoimmune uh, conditions mm -hmm. and you know at the beginning they say no if I take uh, peptides I get and me I say what are you talking about but yeah it may happen you don't see it much because those conditions you don't see them that often mm -hmm. but that's that's the one thing you have to be careful of mm -hmm. so uh, always what I tell people if you never ever use peptides the first first time, maybe use a fraction of what you intended to use mm -hmm. uh, and wait, wait 20 minutes, half an hour and look if there is, a, if it's a small quantity, it's going to be more local, mm -hmm. you know, like a rash or it's going to be very red. Then that in, would indicate some kind of uh, autoimmune response and then you have to take another approach. So one of the things that I've found fascinating about peptides is the idea of dosing. Because as you've mentioned, there are papers coming out time and time again, like almost probably by the time we're done this interview, there's at least a dozen oh. other papers, right? Yeah. And dosing uh, is always individual. How do you look at dosing? And maybe we can use BPC-157 as an example, because yeah. are, are we, should we be doing sort of like with psychedelics, the Shulgin method of titrating? Or how do you look at that? Okay. What I found is that it's the response is dose related. Mm -hmm. Bluntly, the more you take, the more effect mm -hmm. you'll have. And uh, I've seen very high dosages of peptide use that usually that most people they say what, and with no so far with no diminished. Uh, return. You know, uh, many times when you take uh, a compound, there is one point where if you double the dose, you won't double the effect. Mm -hmm. That's called a diminished return. Mm -hmm. And it gets kind of worse as you take more. But with peptide, with most of those I've worked with, I, I didn't see that diminished return yet. Yeah, probably it exists, but at much higher dosages. Uh, there is that other one that's a great, usually... I like to work, use them both at the same time because they, they do pretty much the same thing, but from different angle. It's time as in beta four. Mm -hmm. That's an amazingly good repairing peptide. And uh, there is one study, it was studied, where they wanted to see the toxicity of uh, time as in beta four or TB500 mm -hmm. to its normal. And they gave up to. 1.26 gram. That's a of, that's a hell of a lot of peptide. <laughs> that's nobody look nobody takes that. Yeah, but they they gave that to a group of people for fourteen per day for fourteen days in a row, and then they stop and basically they concluded they didn't want to go higher, mm -hmm. but they say no look that no side effects everything is good you know. Probably they ran out of money. Uh, so they say, no, we're all, all good with this one. High dosages, no 
problem. Uh, that was for 14 days, maybe like, yeah, because some people, they talk about long-term side effects mm-hmm. and uh, that's another thing. Because if you look on papers at the pathways that are used, some people may deduce that, oh yeah, that could be bad for you. But Which pathways are we talking about here? Uh, I, I don't know the specific. It's very general. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it could be a pathway that may be pro-cancer, for example. So, so like mTOR, just take for an example. Or mTOR, that's another yeah. pathway, or MPK pathways, mm-hmm. or other intermediary biochemical pathways. So the thing is, there is all compounds, they work through different pathways. And uh, what's important, it's not to look at only one pathways, but it's to look at the global effect. Mm-hmm. And again, that's where clinicians are ahead of the curves. And when I say clinicians, I'm not include only a doctor MD. No, it could be the coach who has been working with professional athletes and use those peptides for 20 years. Mm-hmm. He has a pretty good idea of uh, what's happening. And the point is that it has been used for a couple of decades already, those mainstream ones. No. And nobody got cancer. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, if one person would have got a cancer from that, we would know. You You'd know, hear, you it's, like, it's like the Tesla it, crashing, right? On cell Yeah, phone. it would be all over the place. Mm-hmm. And we're talking millions of people that's unpublished data, so to say, but no, nobody got cancer from that or bad things or a mm-hmm. uh, third leg uh, growing up or <laughs> things like that. You know, no, no, it's not happening. So uh, back in the 80s, we had, I, I, I was hearing the same thing about steroids, you know, mm-hmm. oh, cancer and you don't know in 30 years uh, what's going to happen. Where? No, we're 30 years after. And no, you know, besides people dying today, as we mentioned before, it's not because of the actual steroids. It's because of the extra weight that is kept using them. But, you know, it's not the, uh, if a guy in his 50s gets a heart attack, it's not the actual steroids that gave him the heart attack attack mm-hmm. it's the side effect or the effect of using it it's the overweight uh, maybe his diet combined to that yeah he's gonna get a heart attack because his heart is is in no condition so you understand what i'm saying right, right? so basically with peptides that's what that's what you see okay there is always you know what uh hawking said you know in nature there is no free lunch so you may at pay a price for benefits you're getting Mm -hmm. of peptides. But truth is, for most of them, so far, I don't know what the price is. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much a free lunch so far. So uh, just on BPC-157, coming back to that, if you were to take it for, let's say, leaky gut or some sort of uh, gut issue, Mm -hmm. oral versus injectable, and I guess the second caveat on the injectable is do you need to inject it in the stomach lining or is this sub Q? That's probably no. Uh, If you take it sub Q, then you get a systemic effect. It doesn't matter where you inject it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people, they talk about uh, near the injury. If it's a, Uh, skeletal muscular injury, Mm -hmm. but near is not good enough because what is near for you, if you look closely, you know, if you have a elbow injury and you do a sub-Q near, there is still a bunch of tissues between the actual injury and the injection site. Mm -hmm. So your peptide will be snatched by blood circulation and will come back to the injury through a systemic process. Uh, it does work locally and 
I know of uh, some doctors doing infiltrations of peptides, like they do with cortisone, mm-hmm. they do with peptides, but that's like with ultrasounds and they go right into the injury site. Interesting. And you have a better effect because the peptides, they, uh, they respond to uh, basically inflammation and other uh, signaling factors. So if you shoot all of the peptide at the injury site, it won't start to go around. It's going to say, oh, we're there, you know, and they will concentrate there uh, before going into circulation. Mm -hmm. So you will get a much better effect, but that's very specific to inside, right at the injury, not near the injury. That that doesn't cut it. You have to be right into it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's a systemic and you could inject in your foot for an elbow problem and you would get the same results. Uh, the other approach, and you still get the systemic effect, is uh, oral. And BPC-157 is one of the very, very few that has, uh, uh, it's orally absorbed, but poorly. Mm-hmm. So you have to at least, uh, in that case, uh, double the dosage. Okay. And even if it's for a gut issue, uh, that's a bit like what I explained. Yeah, it's inside the guts, but it's not inside the injury. Mm -hmm. It will diffuse systematically to come back to that gut problem. Mm -hmm. So it's not because it's oral that it's going to work better for the guts. That's a myth. Uh, It will work great because it does work were great for the gut, but the same as an injection, uh, but adjusting the dosages. Okay. I want to transition into some that I haven't actually played around with myself yet, but I'm more curious than anything. Uh, so looking at, actually, <laughs> yeah, you came, know, that, 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 that came out funny. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause we're going to transition now into <laughs> talking about arousal peptides, which are, <laughs> <laughs> wow. We're going to have some fun here. Uh, uh, so melanotan too, and uh, some of the melanotan family, I would love to hear more about these because, uh, Subjectively, some of our mutual friends have taken it, and one of the side effects that they note are um, spontaneous erections. Right? Uh, well, I would love to hear. That, it could also that, be a positive spontaneous. effect. It, it there is kind of a delay to the effect. Some it's fast if they take a lot of it, but uh, th- there is a delay that can be anything between two and uh, eight hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely there. Uh, actually, a company a few years ago, they wanted to market Melanotan 2 uh, to compete with Viagra mm-hmm. because uh, you get actually, again, clini- clinically, I've seen it, you get a much... I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> you No, you get a much better effect. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and more so, it's not only the erection, because all, all those Viagra, Cialis, they work uh, locally, right? Mm-hmm. You get uh, better vasodilatation and everything's work, but it's all local. Uh, Melanotan 2 and its derivate uh, PT141, uh, you get the same effect without the tanning, so it's pretty targeted there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it works in in the brains, in the receptors for MSH in the brain. Uh, that uh, okay, it will provoke erections, but it will increase libido, mm-hmm. and uh, from A to Z, meaning that. Uh, you actually get better orgasms mm-hmm. when when you use uh, those compounds. Um, uh, what to say? Well, how about uh, melanotan two in particular? Oh yeah, right? you get a tan too out of it. Yeah, that's true. You did. <laughs> I, I've I've seen people come back very brown because of the melanin effect. But what? Yeah, are, because they like it too much for the other effect. Uh-huh. And, 
they, they turn black. Yeah. So aside from the two that we've mentioned, any additional effects? Yes. Is there a knock-on effect to testosterone with melanotan too? Uh, it may raise a bit uh, LH, mm-hmm. I think. But again, you know, like people, they say it's even it cuts a bit appetite, so they will introduce it in the weight loss uh, program. But that's my, you know, I wouldn't count on that to lose weight. You know, it's it, the effect is there, but it's mild. Mm-hmm. So, and for most people, overweight, the problem often is not metabolic; it's psychological. Of course. You know, they, they, they. So. Even if you give them something to mildly cut appetite, they will override that and keep eating. Yeah. Uh, so now, if you're on a diet and you're controlling it and everything is good, and then you add a compound like melanotan, yes, it will help to uh, be less hungry. But not the other way around. Don't use it to become less hungry and hoping to lose weight. Yeah. You you understand? Yeah. I think just in general, I I think going for pills to lose weight is a pretty poor idea or injections is a pretty poor idea. Because everybody is looking for the magic pill Mm -hmm. for everything. And no, we're not there and we're far from there. Uh, All those peptides uh, and compounds, there are tools to add to the basic mm-hmm. exercise, diet, uh, sleep, hygiene, you know, all those things. You have to do it. And then you add peptides to support and make things work better. Okay, it's like no trapping. Yeah. People, they take them and they say, well, you know, it's not working. Yeah, but what are you doing? Are you sitting in front of the TV, watching TV all day? Uh, If you don't use your brain, it's like a muscle, then it won't grow. So first you have to give the stimulus, Mm -hmm. and then the nootropic will add, will make it work better. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's the same thing with those compounds. They do work, but if you depend on them, uh, and and that's the sad part about biohacking. Uh, uh, I've been to a few biohacking uh, conferences, mm-hmm. and it's amazing the number of people attending, even presenters that are out of shape, uh, obese sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can see in their face, they're not healthy, but they're biohacking. They're looking for that magic pill, trying all kinds of combinations. Yeah. It's not, it's not going to happen. Uh, uh, and again, for no tropic, they say, "Oh, uh, no tropics won't make you more intelligent. At best, they will help you keep what you have, mm-hmm. well, which is amazingly good yeah. if they do that. But uh, become more intelligent, you know that uh, limitless pill uh, NZT. Everybody's looking for that. Right? Yeah, uh, probably because there are people looking for it, mm-hmm. or, you know, in labs and everything. It, Eventually, probably they'll find something, but we're not there yet. There is one molecule. It's a protein. It's the clotho protein. Yeah, clotho. This that, is a fun that one. is uh, promising. Mm-hmm. You know, it showed actual actual increase in IQ from two to six points. I think. Which wow, is huge. You know, uh, I want some. <laughs> is it, it, before we go down, I I, I do want to talk a little bit more about melanotan, but uh, oh, yeah, clo- no, yeah, no, no, but clotho. Can you get clotho anywhere right now? You don't have time for that forty-five minute jog. Frankly, who jogs anymore? You need something fast, efficient, and leaves you wanting more. My favorite tool for this, and I love it is the Carol. She is a life-changing bike that provides you all the endurance you need in two 20-second bursts. Yes, you heard that correct. That's 40 seconds of max effort. Including the warm-up and cool-downs, you get a kick-ass workout in 8 minutes and 40 seconds. How? The Carol is a resistance bike powered by artificial intelligence, which personalizes and optimizes the resistance so you hit your maximum intensity levels and maximize glycogen depletion 
every single time. The proof is really in the pudding. Carol's effectiveness was independently verified by the American Council on Exercise. I gave the Carol bike a spin at Health Optimization Summit in London this year, and she kicked my ass so much that I had to get one. Check out Carol at carolfitai.com. That's C-A-R-O-L-F-I-T-A-I.com. If you have limited time and want a kick-ass workout, which basically everyone that listens to this show does, use the code DECODING150 for a $150 discount. Head over to carolfitai.com to secure yours. Uh, you can get it. Uh, we don't. We cannot make it mm-hmm. because it's too big. It's a protein. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't looked into it. I've been put in touch with a, a researcher in California, I think, mm-hmm. yes. doing research on it, and I'm looking into being included in one of his research groups. So uh, that would be fun. Yeah, but basically, uh, being a protein then. It's hard to find, except from those um, very high-tech labs that make those, and that's amazingly expensive. Yeah, I can imagine. So melanotan-1 versus melanotan-2, what is the difference, per se? Um, I'm not sure, actually. I know there is moral difference, mm-hmm. differences. Um, I think melanotan-2 is more targeted. Okay. Uh, you you need less to have the same effect, but I, I've uh, I, I never stopped looking at melanotan one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw well, I got everything I need with melanotan two, so I I, I couldn't answer that. Mm-hmm. And then the actual difference. And then PT one four ones the is that the female equivalent? No, okay. it's the equivalent. It works great for men okay. as melanotan two. So, but. If you're dark already, you don't want to get darker, then you use PT-14. It's a modified version of melanotan 2 mm-hmm. where they were able to take off the uh, tanning effect. Okay, interesting. So, Can we talk now about the growth hormone secretagogue families? Um, okay. So I look at these, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because you know, I'm just the end of one <laughs> guinea pig. Uh, the Morlin family, so Tessa and Ipa Morlin. Yes. So my my experience with growth hormone comes more from the bodybuilding world and somewhat from the SARMs okay. world. Uh, what? How can we use the Morlin family strategically, and what kind of benefits can we get? Okay. Um. Well, basically, they make you secrete your own growth hormone, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and and I, I met a few people, they told me, yeah, but I got a prescription already of growth hormone, so why should I take that? Uh, well, first, it's a lot cheaper. And two is, uh, it's more natural, so to say, it's your own growth hormone and it comes out and your own natural way, mm-hmm. you know, the peak and the way it goes down. So it's, uh, yes, you force the, the secretion, but it's not like a brick falling on you, like when you inject GH and bang, it's in there and deal with it. So that's one thing. It's more natural. Two, it turns out that the actual peptides has uh, an activity in tissues Mm -hmm. and dependent from the growth hormone secretion, meaning that even if there was no growth hormone secretion, the peptides, because they're ghrelin uh, similar, Mm -hmm. there are ghrelin receptors in all tissues, muscle, bone, liver, everywhere. So those peptides bind to those receptors in other tissues and have a positive effect. Then you have the secretion of the growth hormone that goes around. So you have a second wave of uh, positive effect from the growth hormone that has its own receptor. And then you have a third wave because through the liver, uh, you have uh, IGF-1 that is secreted. 
due to the rise in growth hormone. Mm. So you have a third wave. Uh, IGF-1 has its own receptors that has positive effect on the tissues. So basically, if you inject growth hormones straight up, you have two waves of positive effect. If you use uh, growth hormone secretagogues, you have three waves. You have an extra layer of positive effects mm-hmm. that happen. So at, at this point, the only time uh, I would use actual growth hormone is if you would want an uh, extra physiological level because there is so much you can secrete. Mm-hmm. So if you wanted more, then I wouldn't give up. I would still take the growth hormone secretagogue and then add some growth hormone to get extra levels. Okay. But if you're into anti-aging and, you know, a bit of uh, body composition, uh, you're, you will do great with only the growth hormone secretagogues. You won't need at all the growth hormone itself. So with so that, that, that's basically the difference. So the growth hormone... Um uh, the growth hormone, when I think of people overusing growth hormone, I go back to that bodybuilding analogy, right? Wow. And so people who just ramp it up, hit the gas pedal, et cetera. But what we're doing here is just, if we're making some sort of dish, if you will, we're just contributing ingredients to that dish in order to complete the dish. Do I have that right? Exactly, because what happened is starting around the age of 25, your own secretion of growth hormones start to decrease. Mm-hmm. So by the age of 50, 60, 70, it's kind of very low. So as you said, in, in uh, anti-aging purposes or healing, uh, you, you don't secrete enough. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, people take uh, testosterone in their later years as a testosterone replacement therapy. Mm. So growth hormone should be considered to within the hormonal replacement therapy. And again, uh, those uh, growth hormone secretagogue do the job Mm -hmm. because, you know, your own secretion decreases, but it's very rare that uh, your ability to secrete it decrease, meaning you take a 80 years old, give him a secretagogue, and bang, it is going to start to secrete growth hormone the same as when he was 25. Mm-hmm. So basically, it's trying to bring back, not taking too much, but bring back youthful levels. So is there any age at which point it's probably too early to start this? Like, should you? Uh, yeah, 12. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think a 12 year old anywhere or, you know, somebody who's going into puberty probably shouldn't be touching this stuff, but yeah, but no, listen, uh, as a rule, it's hard to tell. Basically you, you look, you have some blood tests done mm-hmm. and look at your levels mm-hmm. and uh, then decide. Because like women, some women, they get uh, menopausal uh, early 40s. Other, they get menopausal uh, Mm mid-50s. You know, there is a range of ages. And the best is just to do a simple blood test, look at IGF-1 levels, a couple of other markers, and then decide, okay, that could be a good time to to start. Mm -hmm. But to look at those markers before the age of 30, 35, uh, I don't think the need would be there. Okay. So looking at, um, so Tessa and Ipamorlin specifically, um, well, well, one thing that we talked about was the ghrelin receptors and how it acts on that. Well, there are two classes. Tessa Morilin is a growth hormone uh, Releasing hormone analog, and epimorelin is a growth hormone releasing peptide or a ghrelin uh, mimicker. Okay, uh, there there are two class different Interesting. receptors. Okay, and so how does let's say and you can take either one? How do they act differently? Is epimorelin the one that you just walk through in terms of its sequence? Yeah, that's why when you take them individually. 
you get results because they kind of cross over in their activity. Mm -hmm. But uh, with a stronger effect in one class and a stronger effect in the other one. So the growth hormone GHRH is more to send a signal to the pituitary gland to produce, to start synthesizing growth hormone mm -hmm. and a weaker sig signal to secrete it. As the uh, growth hormone releasing peptide, uh, is stronger on the releasing part uh, and less on the synthesis. Mm -hmm. So that's why tesamorelin, you see, uh, you know, it's uh, it has been very publicized. Well, one pharmaceutical company uh, sells it. Mm -hmm. So, oh, you know, publicity, big rage about it. You know, it all goes together. It's not that much better, but it was pushed by uh, the pharmaceutical uh, world. Uh, it, it, you have to take a lot of it to see those effects. That's one milligram or two per day. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you take epimorelin, there are people who have taken the, those high dosages uh, up to uh, one or two milligrams. And you have great effects too, but you have to take a lot. Uh, but what was found out many back in the 90s is that if you use much smaller dosages, but at the same time, that's one of those cases when you have one plus one equal three, four, or even five, mm -hmm. because you, you, you send both signals at the same time, so you have a huge synthesis and a huge secretion. So, uh, uh, if it's because people they compare tesamorelin with CGC, but it's a false comparison mm -hmm. because it's different dosages. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you use uh, one milligram of tesamorelin well compared to one milligram of CGC 1295 and then see if there is a difference or not mm -hmm. uh, or you know but now they compare one milligram of uh, tesamorelin with a hundred microgram of CGC and a hundred microgram of uh, epimorelin so even if it's an uh, enhanced effect because we combine them, dosage-wise, you know, you're in the tenfold difference. So uh, you cannot co really compare. And clinically, I've, I no, uh, actually most people prefer the combination of CGC-1295 epimorelin and smaller dosages to the high dosages of uh, Tesamorelin. Okay, so just in terms of dosing, you need a higher dosage of one milligram for tesamorelin in order to have. Well, that, that that's because again, because it's taken alone. So if you want that strong secretion effect, you have, you take more, so mm -hmm. it's going to kick in more. But uh, uh, if you are to take tesamorelin, me, I would say take less mm -hmm. and take it with epimorelin. And so, and what would, would be less? Amazing result. What would be less? Yes, in that case? I, I would go. I would go to uh, those the same as uh, CGC. Mm -hmm. But again, if you use same dosages, probably you'll see pretty much the same effect. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I I don't know of anybody who tried it, but that would be interesting. You know, try. Uh, I I'm happy to get it. <laughs> Okay, well, one milligram of tesamorelin mm -hmm. for a few weeks. Take a break and then try a milligram of CGC-1295 for, for a few weeks That's and see if th there is actually a difference mm -hmm. or not. Uh, so, okay, we've covered tesamorelin and ipamorelin pretty well now. Um, looking at CJC, because you just brought it up, uh, yes. One of the things I found fascinating about it is you can use it as a topical, um, or I've seen it as a topical. <laughs> I, I would, okay, since you're laughing, I would like to hear more about. Well, the first topical. line of defense of the body is the skin. Mm -hmm. 
And on the skin, we have protease, enzymes that digest proteins, mm -hmm. including peptides. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, you would put a, a peptide on the skin, some of it will be destroyed mm -hmm. before it's, it's absorbed. Now, if the part, what percentage will be absorbed, it depends on its, uh, if, uh, if it's uh, hydrophob or hydrophilic, that has to do the size of the peptide, the thickness of the skin, Uh, of course, if you apply it within the, you know, the little hole in the, uh, the fold of your arm, mm -hmm. the skin is very thin there. Uh, it's gonna, it would be, but it, it will never be. Uh, those are solutions they give for people that for some reason don't want or like scared bad shit from injection. Okay. So they say, okay. But no, you, you will, you probably you will have some absorption, but Forget about the 100%. And you see it usually in uh, like testosterone. Mm -hmm. You have testosterone creams. Yeah. Uh, you get like maybe 5% absorption. Mm -hmm. So that becomes very uh, costly. So for a peptide, let's say you have the, about the same absorption, 5%, 10%. So it's going to cost you 10 times more. Mm -hmm. So not saying it's not working. But, hey, if you can afford it and uh, you don't want at all to inject, uh, 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 yeah, but no. Uh, they do it. Uh, a lot of people uh, of companies, uh, pharmaceutical and not, they always come up with new products like that mm -hmm. uh, to be the to make that, okay, we have that, nobody else have. And people who don't know much about that, they say, oh, yeah, it must be good. And there is a lot of marketing behind that. But the actual science of uh, skin absorption, it's not great. Why don't they make patches of uh, insulin, for example, mm -hmm. or growth hormone or this or that? Uh, insulin is a peptide. And, you know, yeah, that, that, that would be much more that would make a lot, a lot of sense for diabetic people. They're stuck for uh, four, five, three, four injections per day for the rest of their life. Yeah, let's make a patch for those people. So, you know, they don't have to worry much about uh, timing and everything, but they don't because it doesn't work. So, and suddenly you have those people, they say, yeah, okay, it doesn't work for insulin, but it works for a CGC. Well, how? No. Uh, there is always some absorption, but it's very small, mm -hmm. very small. So, and to me, it's not worked well. So CJC 1295, uh, better injected. It sounds like sub Q now peptides always, always um, in terms better. of dosages, are we talking a hundred? I think you said micrograms, right? A microgram. Okay. Uh, with those, you get the diminished return. Mm -hmm. So it seems that the peak effect, it's at around one microgram per kilogram of body weight. Okay. Not saying, now, if you double that dosage, okay, I'll put it another way. So you have that secretion of growth hormone. Uh, if you want to double the secretion, roughly, mm -hmm. uh, you need to take about four times the peptide. Wow. You understand? Yeah. That's what I was talking about, diminished return. Gotcha. There is a point where you have to take a lot more to get a smaller effect. Uh, so that's why usually they recommend, when they say 100 microgram that's based on a hundred kilo person and it kind of become mainstream. Most people don't know where it comes from, mm -hmm. but it comes from that one microgram per uh, kilogram of body weight. So yeah, you can take more, but if you double the dosage, you will get about 25% 
uh, um, maybe more, maybe 50% more secretion. And if you double that, then another 25. Gotcha. It's not that the receptor are saturated, but they're getting more clogged, mm-hmm. so to say, so you get less effect. So the optimal uh, dosage is around that, one microgram per kilogram. One of the, I think the last area, at least for today, I want to touch on are, are some of these longevity peptides, which have come to my awareness recently, mm-hmm. um, kind of the FOXO3, FOXO4 families. What are oh, your yes. opinions on these? Because one, it's very hard to test the success of longevity, right? <laughs> um, yeah, we'll have to wait. Uh, a few yeah, years. and you know, I look at these and say, "Hey, Foxo four, Foxo three, that's that's super promising." But what do we know about them? Okay, well, basically, mostly that the one that is being used right now, Foxo four DRI. Uh, it kills uh, senescent cells. Mm-hmm. So, uh, senescent cell basically it's a cell that it is at it's uh, the end of its life, but doesn't want to die. Mm-hmm. So it's not doing anything anymore for the for the body, but it's still metabolized. So excretes. Uh, inflammatory factors, uh, all kind of things you don't want, but it's not doing nothing positive. So as we grow older, we start to accumulate those senescent cells, and they're just lying there, just making trouble, basically. So that peptide, uh, through the P53 pathways, uh, I Kills, kills them, makes them die. So you get rid of them. Mm-hmm. So the theory is that senescence, it, the base of it are senescent cells. And in, in mice, it, it works uh, amazingly. Even like the, the, the marker of mice, if you extrapolate to human, a three months therapy on mice brought them uh, a human equivalent to 20 years younger, not only stop the aging, it make them actually younger by 20 years equivalent. You know, they had, they were black mice, so they had gray hair Mm -hmm. and the hair came back black and all the markers they looked at were improved to more youthful levels. So the effect was amazing. Now, uh, from the actual guy, uh, that German guy who, they work on those peptides now in Germany, I think, uh, or Holland, maybe, I'm not mm-hmm. sure. Uh, the problem with that one in particular is that it will kill roughly one sane cell for every 10 senescent cells Interesting. it's going to kill. So you have to be a bit careful with mm-hmm. that. Uh, so first, uh, there is not so much use to use it if you are 50 or less because you then start to accumulate or you could do just a little bit. Uh, so I'm not sure, quite sure how to work with it. I wouldn't go on the full therapy <laughs> with it because you would kill too many sane cells yeah. at once. I would, if... I started using it, but I'm very careful. And what I'm doing is I'll do maybe three to five shots spread out on a couple of weeks and then leave it, leave it for a couple of months. Mm-hmm. So you will kill a bunch of senescent cells. You will kill some sane cells, but then not that many because you don't go full uh, protocol. So you rebuild those same cells that you kill and, you know, those organs and everything. Mm -hmm. And then another small uh, couple of weeks and two months where you rebuild. And maybe you could introduce BPC-157 in the after to help uh, repairing the little damages you made, cellular damages. Mm -hmm. So maybe that would be a safe approach of using it right now. I know they're working on the... New version, I don't know what they're going to call it, where now the ratio would be 100 to 1. Okay. Uh, so now that's more interesting. Yeah. Uh, they, they didn't release the, 
the sequence, so we cannot make it. But uh, it will become available eventually. Uh, so it's very promising. But again, they're doing a bunch of research. There is a good, good video, an interview with the guy who discovered or came up with that molecule. And uh, he has very insightful information on it. He says, because yeah, senescence is the root and FOXO4 works, but not at all the aspect of uh, killing senescent mm -hmm. cells. And in the future, probably, and there are other labs working on other molecules that work on other aspects of the uh, senescent cells mm -hmm. to get rid of them. So probably within a few years, you will have a more complete anti-senescence uh, but around maybe three, four, five peptides, you know, working uh, different angles. And then you will have a more sound uh, therapy. Uh, but we're going there. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that you're not going to die because uh, that is actually programmed mm -hmm. in our DNA. Uh, we're stuck with that. Uh, and that's why we do all those things, you know, because... If your whole body, when you're young, is programmed to grow, to reproduce, uh, but at a certain age, and that's genetically programmed, then that starts to kick in, or the dying processes. Mm -hmm. So the you, you may train all you want and have the best of diet. The only way to uh, push that away further or or at least to get a better quality of life is eventually you have to tweak with that biochemistry. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do with peptides. Mm -hmm. So among yeah, other synalytics is a fascinating field and we've had Aubrey de Grey on the show as well. Um, who's, who's doing a lot of interesting research here and thank you for sharing this. Now, Jean-Francois, has anybody blown themselves up yet with peptides? Are there any sort of horror stories that we've heard come out of the world? No, again, to come back, the only uh, horror stories I've seen is with autoimmune response to peptide and people not knowing they would get that response. They took a full dose and bang, you know, they would become like red like a lobsters and things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, but uh, beside that, uh, no, no, nothing. Uh, so on the autoimmune response, is that it hasn't induced an autoimmune condition. It's more just that response itself, and then it goes away? Uh, yeah, it goes away mm -hmm. as soon as the peptide uh, degrades. But then that can be worked on because there are there is one peptide that, uh, modulate the immune response and uh, that's time as an alpha mm -hmm. one. So usually when you have uh, somebody like that, then you put them exclusively on time as an alpha mm -hmm. one for a few weeks to stabilize, so to say, the immune system. And then they can start uh, uh, peptide therapy for their condition. The immune system has been taken care of so and then usually you can start uh, uh, peptide therapy without uh, any problem mm -hmm. one of the uh, common criticisms on this and i know uh, we're coming up on time because you're very generous with this mm -hmm. but uh, one of the common criticisms of peptides is sourcing and how to get oh, but how to get good source uh, for peptides because you know there's been studies out there that have just said like hey most of this is oh, garbage they, they, I'm, 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 I'm surprised I knew that most of those companies on the internet would uh, get from uh, China mm -hmm. but to such an extent I'm still surprised it's ridiculous uh, you know I think in September I came up with a little video, very unprofessional. Uh, I have a YouTube channel. It's CanLab mm -hmm. on YouTube, and the video is there. Uh, it's very unprofessional, but people, you know, I have a company. We synthesize peptide in Montreal, uh, but 
uh, it's easy to say, you know, all those people, they say, no, they show you pictures of huge labs. But, with, you know, it's easy to get pictures of the internet, of labs. So after three years and people, you know, yeah, you make them in Montreal. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, I, I said, I'm going to make, I was in the lab. I gave my friend my phone. I said, let's make a small video. And in the video, I showed, I showed pretty much everything. You know, the, the, the reactors where the peptide is sensitized, the HPLC machine to test, the, the little thing we use to put in vials. So to show people, yeah, look, it's me on the video and, Here's the lab, and we're it, we're making it right now. So me, I expected kind of a response to that from those big players. You know, uh, I won't name anybody or any company, but I say, okay, you know, they'll come up with something and much better, more professional, and nobody came out so far. It's like, is it because they don't want to or because they can't? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it makes you think, you know, if they could and they don't, that's not a good marketing move. Yeah. So, uh, so if they don't, it makes you think that's because they don't make them. So they cannot show you to that extent them making them because they don't. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the problem getting them from China, Chinese are known to be very... Uh, if they can pass you a fast one, they will. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the worst case I've seen is them putting on the market growth hormone, and they would release the best growth hormone you could get on, on the net for about six months. And that's many years ago. And then there is one drug, I don't know which one, that gives you a lot cheaper than growth hormone, that gives you that uh, carpal tunnel inflammation. Yeah as a side effect. So they replace the growth, the growth hormone by that drug. So people, they add that effect, growth hormone, it's working. Ah, I get carpal tunnel inflammation after a month or two, so it must be good. So they started to sell that drug instead of the growth hormone. Mm-hmm. And people will get that carpal tunnel inflammation so they say, oh, yeah, it must be it. You know, it's I, I get the side effect of good growth hormone. Mm-hmm. And, they, uh, and until somebody one day decided to test and they say, well, there is no growth hormone in there. They did that for a long, <laughs> long time. And because that's the thing. People don't, they don't have access. They cannot test things, you know, or it's very expensive. And okay, for example, uh, now we're, we, we we found out that we can synthesize it, so we'll make uh, diexa. But uh, meanwhile, I wanted some diexa, so I ordered from one of those reputable company on the mm-hmm. net. And but first thing I did, I, we tested it because I was a bit suspicious. I said, no, it's too cheap to be true. You know, I know how can they sell it that cheap? Well, it turns out it was not diexa. It was a mix of three or four compounds. I don't know which one. That probably would give the same kind of effect. Mm -hmm. You know, you get that. Maybe some other nootropics, much cheaper. But the point is, it wasn't the hexa. Mm -hmm. But I found out because we have HPLC and it took five minutes. We tested it and, oh, that's not the hexa. Mm -hmm. But for most most people, they cannot do that. Yeah, we don't have HPLCs in our home, <laughs> and, and the Chinese know that, mm-hmm. so oh, they, they they take advantage of that fact. Testing. So, Jean Francois, in terms of sports right now and professional sports, are we able to test for the use of peptides at all? Yes and no. Okay. Yes, because they are detectable in the blood. Mm-hmm. But again, I mentioned uh, protease. We have protease in the mm-hmm. blood, so no peptides. Most of them they won't last, like at most twelve hours. Mm-hmm. And then no blood test on the planet right now will detect them. Mm-hmm. So, if you use a peptide. Uh, 
so what is done right now in the sport world is they take much higher dosages, but more uh, instead of every day, maybe once a week. Mm -hmm. So they get, and it's a bit like training. You know, if you give a big, big stimulus, you know, you train for an hour, but you build muscle for a few days after. So the mTOR is, the stimulus is not there anymore, mm -hmm. but the metabolic chain is. So with a lot of peptides, uh, not, well, uh, you see that. So you take a very high dosage. The peptide itself is gone after, let's say, 12 hours. Mm -hmm. But the after effect lasts for many days. So that's what they do now. So they would be very unlucky to be tested in that 12 hours frame over a week. Gotcha. You know? So they take that, they take that chance. Interesting. Uh, even if they are random uh, testing. So basically that's how it's done at this point. What peptides are you taking right now? Right now I take CGC 1295 with the Pamorelin. Um, melanotan two once in a while to keep my tan, <laughs> obviously, not for the other effect. I'm 56, so yeah, you know, a bit of mm -hmm. um, once in a while, maybe one shot of thymazine beta four, mm -hmm. maybe once every two weeks, a preventive, you know, repair little things here and there, and uh. I did not so long ago. I did mud see for a month every day. I loved it. Uh, have you done NAD plus? Oh, I, I have. I have done more sub Q injections. Not, not okay. Good. Do you like it? Well, I think the, the, the IV. I didn't really notice an effect. To be fair. Okay, uh, me. I've done and the first time I, after five days. It took five days to kick mm -hmm. in. I had a very strong effect. I loved mm -hmm. it. But you take mud see. It's like NAD plus on steroids. And what's the compound? It's, How do you spell that compound? Uh, M O M uh, M O T S yeah. dash uh, uh, bar C. Mats. Oh, awesome. C. Uh, it upregulates NAD plus, but it's a mitochondrial peptide. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. And uh, basically, people, when they, they, the first first study, they were looking at metabolic uh, uh, syndrome, you know, where you have high blood pressure, uh, insulin resistance, and uh, high cholesterol. So, And that molecule works on all of that, brings it down. Mm -hmm. But there is a bunch of... Uh, we could do another podcast one day on uh, those. We, we, we are, because this is fascinating. But let's see. Uh, listen... You feel so good on that, you know, energy-wise. It could be psychologically addictive. Okay. And, uh, but you really rev up the mitochondria. So I wouldn't do it uh, all the mm -hmm. time. But, you know, once in a while. Also, that one I'm about uh, maybe a couple of weeks again. Uh, that's pretty much it. it for, now we're synthesizing new peptides. I will try them mm -hmm. out. Uh like for example, okay, you you were asking uh, melanotan two in uh, higher dosages is very good for it's very anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. But the problem is if you use it for that, then you will become too uh, ridiculously dark. Yeah. So, but they found out that it's the three a part a fraction of melanotan two three amino acids that have that anti-inflammatory effect. Mm -hmm. So now we're just finishing a batch. We synthesize it. So you get only the anti-inflammatory effect. So there is a few new ones that uh, we're working on. Uh, we could... Uh, like we could have another podcast on those uh, Russian bioregulators. They're like epitalon and all. There is about twenty-five of them. It's it's amazing. As I told you, you know, when we got in touch, one podcast we're only scratching the surface. Well, of, I, I'm gonna, uh, uh, of all that, I want to have you back on. So we're gonna scratch the surface some more because <laughs> I think this could be a no, 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 problem. an ongoing conversation. Uh, Jean Francois, just cognizant of your time, I want to move over into just the final six rapid fire questions, if it's okay with sure. you. Um, what is your favorite piece of technology that you bought in the past year? The 
Ura ring, mm -hmm. I like. And, uh, oh, just a little parenthesis. Uh, you know why, why it's good to speak many languages? They did that study at the, in one of the most reputable hospitals in uh, Paris. In their sleep clinic, they tested like 15 uh, sleep monitors mm -hmm. or tracking devices. And the two that they found to be actually uh, correct and precise were the Uva Ring okay. and, and the Fitbit. And the Fitbit? Really? <laughs> that yeah. Wasn't yeah, they found, you know, because they would compare. They would have people in the sleep clinic, you know, with all the thing on the yeah. brain, the electrodes and everything. And they compared the results from the monitor and their results. And those were the two outstanding. All the other ones. Now, I, I, I'll, again, I'll, I'll find that. I don't know if they published it, but uh, at least the article, uh, it comes from a French uh, scientist. And so we'll go, you know, a bit like uh, scientific American, mm -hmm. but French. Uh, I'll, I'll send it to you. Please so do. those were the two outstanding uh, devices. So I was happy because my wife, she used the Fitbit and I have the URA. So uh, we're good. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know which other one they tested. So not to put down any other yeah. ones because I don't know which one they are. Interesting. Uh, so that one I like. I got that uh, Carol bike. Yeah, you, you and I both <laughs> like the Carol. I, I like it. Well, basically because I'm lazy, but we're, you know, that's, I, why do you go into, again, biohacking and all those things? Basically, it's because we're lazy. <laughs> uh, no, you know, I, I'm not ashamed to say it. That's the base of any invention. Of, that's why society, that's why most inventions are made by men. Mm -hmm. Uh, women are not lazy, so they're not so creative in finding things to make things easier. Uh, you know, I, again, I don't want to get into a political. Uh, or, we we don't have to call it to, to be politically incorrect, but you know, historically, that's pretty much it. So, well, yeah. So the 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 Carol bike, I love it for that. You know, nine minutes, and I, it does work. Mm -hmm. You know, you see, uh, you feel it absolutely. So I like that, and I've got. Yeah, within a year, that thing from uh, Scandinavia, you know, the, the what's, I have it somewhere. No, you put in your ears, earphones, but it's with light. Oh, um, the human charger. Yeah, human charger. I've used it many times, but I'm not very sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. So I cannot tell if it works or not. Mm -hmm. But I'm using it. You know, I trust uh, the science behind it. So those would be the three. Now I'm looking into, uh, actually next Tuesday, I'm visiting a place here in Montreal where the fabric, uh, hyperbaric uh, chambers. Yeah. So I want, I've read amazingly and got feedbacks uh, of people on, on very specific therapies, like very serious case, uh, like MS and all that. And they get much better results when they do their peptide injections. And right, uh, right after, they go into the hyperbaric uh, chamber. So you have a combined effect that uh, seems to be amazing. I'll, um, after this, we're going to talk because one of my mentors, who's been on the podcast before, is very mm. big into hyperbaric. And I think you guys mm. would have a very good conversation. Oh, uh, nice. Jean-Francois, how do you unwind? <laughs> oh boy! Uh, you know, when I, the thing I like to do the most, and a lot of people don't understand that, uh, it's to do nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, for not like all day long, I couldn't. But that's how I unwind. Uh, I will take maybe half an hour, just sit back. Do nothing. Just think. I don't know. A uh, lot of ideas come out at that during those times, but that's all on the wine. I just stop everything. Don't sleep. Just lay back and do nothing. Uh, I really enjoy doing nothing. It's the power of silence, right? 
Um, favorite holiday or vacation destination? And I am very curious about this one because you've lived all over the world. Yeah, it's difficult because many places I haven't seen, but, uh, and it's biased because a lot of places I lived there. So I've like Mexico, I lived in Mexico city for like 10 years, not the best place to live because of contamination and all that, but, uh, I, I loved, I loved it. And it was in the time where it wasn't so, uh, turbulent mm-hmm. so you know i never had any problem but uh actually the place i love to live the most is at one point i bought a house uh in mexicali okay. two hours from tijuana mm-hmm. i was f- 15 minutes from the border so it was at the best of mexico and the best of the u.s because uh, anytime I, I was in the U.S., maybe three, four times a week, crossing two hours from San Diego, three hours from L.A., seven hours from uh, Las Vegas. So, you know, I was close to all those focus points, so to say. With And, you know, I would cross and in the town, the other side, Calexico, the other Walmart. So if I... You understand? Yeah. I, had, I was right there at the border, so I had the best of both. And I really, and the climate is very hot. In the summer, it's some days it's up to 50 degrees. But I like that. Being Canadian, we're attracted by uh, opposites. Yeah. So it's deserting. It's next to that valley. But I, I loved it. That's, uh, that's one place uh, I wouldn't mind uh, living again. I have to check that out. What is your top trick for enhancing your productivity? Oh, I'm still looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> make lists, lists of things. Because I make them in my head, but then I forget. Mm. So I, I've noticed when I make lists, not, not to do, because some people, they say, no, it's not good to do lists because you end up not doing everything. Yeah. That's true. But at least you do something. Yeah. So I like to make a list. Uh, I'm most productive when I do that. Let's say I have those 10 things to do. And uh, I do what I can that day with priorities. But then what I didn't do, I put it on the next day mm-hmm. list plus other things. And, you know, and basically if I want to be productive, I have to, to do that. that. That's how I get really productive. What's your favorite book? Uh, well, what book has significantly impacted your life and how you show up to perform in it? Uh, uh, Life Extension that was published in 1982. I was only 19 and I was worried about that. (laughs) But uh, Dirk, uh, it's a big book. And what was known at the time was, you know, like for growth hormone secretion, they would prone the ornithine and arginine, Mm. uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Things like that, very, but uh, basically back then, what I took out of that as an anti-aging and they stated it somewhere, when you grow older, the, and that's out of from that book, what you, are, you have to control two things, your uh, glass, uh, glycemia, mm-hmm. your blood uh, glucose or glucose, uh, you know, you can extend, yeah. but glycemia and inflammation. Mm-hmm. Those are two things that you need to keep in check if you want to live long. And and they were right. Basically, everything you see today is all around that. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Now, their approach to it was, you know, they would say, okay, take uh, aspirin for inflammation, things like that. Well, okay. But a lot of things are still good mm-hmm. in that book. Amazing. Jean-Francois, where can people find out more about you? Well, uh, um, the best I think would be I have a Facebook page uh, for Can Lab. I, I, I hate to write, so I don't write much there. But sometimes, oh, you know where there is a Facebook group. It's not my group. It's a woman in Toronto, uh, Natalie, who has it, and about twice a month I do small podcasts mm-hmm. where. Uh, not like this one, but where 
again, it came out from the fact that I don't like to write. So I, I was getting tired of answering the same question over and over, you know, in the group. So what we would, what we do now, we kind of gather, she gathers those questions mm -hmm. that repeat themselves and or those doubts. And then uh, twice a month about, I make maybe a half hour to an hour podcast mm -hmm. answering those questions Amazing. Uh, for the people in the group. So the group, it's called biohacking. <laughs> I, have to I think it it's What's biohacking that? superhuman something. That's it. That's it. I'll link to it in the show. So notes. Actually, I'm going to make a new one tonight. So, uh, you know, if people want to join that group, then uh, it's it's a good place. Those groups, peptide groups, and all that. I get a lot of. Uh, I learn from mm -hmm. that again because you know people they ask questions about things that are happening, and sometimes it makes me. It forces me to look up. You know, I don't know the answer, and I'm learning from that, and it's very interesting. Very. And you can exchange or ask questions, and and then your and company's I, called Can Lab. Is that right? CanLab, no S, C-A-N-L-A-B. So CanLab has a, a Facebook page where sometimes I write little things. And But uh, for information, yeah, that, that, that group is, uh, is pretty good, actually. It's, uh, mm -hmm. And if somebody wanted to speak to you directly, I think CanLab has consultation. Uh, yeah, CanLab.net. And then uh, I offer uh, online like Skype consults and all that. Uh, I, there are two kinds. There is a personal mm -hmm. one and a professional. Sometimes people don't understand. The professional one is much more expensive, but that's for uh, the medical field mm -hmm. because that's a, I do consults with doctors. So, of course, they ask for protocol, but not for, for themselves, but for their clients. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're going to make a bunch of money out of it. Plus, for them, it's tax deductible. Yeah. So, I charge of more. Course. <laughs> of course. Plus, they, they, they have the money. But uh, there is that personal one. That's one-to-one -one for, you know, we discuss uh, peptides. Awesome. Jean-Francois. Thank you for taking the time today. This has been absolutely amazing. And I'm going to go ahead and no, I'm going to bring I, you back for a round pleasure. two because this is like we're only scratching surfaces here. No problem. I would love to. To all the superhumans listening out there, this is Boomer and Jean Francois signing off. Have an epic day. Like I said at the beginning, superhumans, we are just scratching the surface here. If you want us to go deeper, send me an email podcast at decodingsuperhuman.com. I would love to have Jean-Francois come back on for a round two, but we want the demand to be there. So please email me at podcast at decodingsuperhuman.com. Let me know what you think of the episode. Let me know what you think about peptides in general and any questions that you have, and we'll get him back on for that round two. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it on all the social medias. That could be TikTok if you're one of those people, or it could be something like LinkedIn. Let me know what you think. Please comment. Please like. Please share. And again, the show notes for this one are decodingsuperhuman.com slash peptides. Superhumans, have an epic day. <laughs>